I'm travel journalist Bill Cleveland, and this is the Ultimate American Music Bucket List. Uh, of, of course, in that yearbook, they asked the students to list what they wanted their profession to be, and she put entertainer. So she knew. She knew. Tina Turner would go on to fame and fortune as the queen of rock and roll, but her life and first time up on stage started here in Brownsville, Tennessee. In this episode, we take you to the Tina Turner Museum on the ultimate American music bucket list. Tina Turner had one of the most successful careers in American music history. Starting in the late 1950s with husband and musical partner Ike Turner to a remarkable solo career and comeback in the 1980s with songs from the Private Dancer album, including her number one hit song, What's Love Got to Do With It? The schoolhouse where Tina Turner attended class as a child in southwestern Tennessee was saved from demolition and has since been turned into the Tina Turner Museum a project that local resident Sonia Outlaw Clark has been a part of since day one, with the blessing of Tina Turner herself. Let, let's talk a little bit first about, about the area. So uh, Tina Turner, I think we all know from Nutbush, Tennessee, at least if you've heard the uh, Nutbush City Limits uh, song, you, you know the town. But, but tell me a little bit about uh, Nutbush, but also, of course, Brownsville, Tennessee, where the uh, Flag Grove uh, School was located. Sure. So Nutbush was never actually a city, as the song implies. Uh, Tina took some uh, poetic licensing with that. I guess you would call it artistic license with that. Nutbush is a small farming community, which is just outside of Brownsville, uh, about 12 miles outside of the city limit, out in the middle of the county. There was two stores, a gym, of course, a schoolhouse and a church house, more than one outhouse, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, and that's actually where Flag Grove School came from. Now, Flag Grove was not the school she was referring to in the song because in the area that was Nutbush proper at the time, the school there was the white school. And then the communities that surrounded it all had different names. And Flag Grove was the community where Tina lived and attended elementary school, grades one through eight. So Flag Grove School is a one-room African-American schoolhouse that came from the Flag Grove community, which to us nowadays encompasses the whole Nutbush area. And then Brownsville is where she attended two years of high school before moving to St. Louis to be with her mom and and i have lived in st louis for most of my life and yes i know she went to i believe it was rittner high school in st louis is that right i think charles that's right. sumner 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 high school that's yes. right well I, I had one job sonia and i couldn't uh i couldn't even get that right <laughs> <laughs> um all right but back to the back to the area so so she grew up there and then i believe didn't she return a little bit later in life she had to come she had to come back you know, actually, I think she returned uh, quite often. She had some close relatives here. She had a cousin that she was really close to, and she would come and visit her cousin. Um, you know, most of the time, especially after, I think she and Ike maybe came here a time or two. But after that, I think the time she returned here, no one really knew she was here. Yeah. She, You know, she had hit stardom and... So she was kind of in and out without a lot of people knowing it. But she kept in touch with some friends here. And that was actually how we were able to get in touch with her when we started saving the school. That's cool. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that in just a, a minute. I, I, one other thing I just want to. So, you know, I've got this on the uh, American Music Bucket List, which is the, the name of the book. And um, just pointing out places in uh, in the United States that are are part of music history and and you have to assume that this is part of music history because she would have spent you know her formative years in, in the building um 
but I mean, d- did did she remember the school uh, or any of her time in the school, um, or is this just uh, something that that we as fans uh, kind of cherish? No, actually, she did remember her time in the school and in the area. She actually did a a little short video for us talking about what she remembered about the school. There there are still people who went to school with her there in our community, and they've they've talked about stories that they remember. One, uh, remember standing on the stage in the school singing the devotionals in the mornings with her. So uh, she was singing and, and enjoying entertaining people even at that early an age. So it's possible she couldn't have become the queen of uh, rock and roll without her time there on the stage in the in the Flag Grove School. I think, right? I think that's that's. A... Um, and then she also, yeah, and then she also sang in uh, church choirs as well. Are those churches still still there in the area? So there were two churches that she would have attended regularly: uh, Spring Hill Church. The original church has been torn down, but a new church is in its place. That church is still an active church. The Woodlawn Missionary Baptist Church, where she would have attended, is also still there. Um, And the reason, one of the reasons why she attended both churches is it was on a circuit. So service would have been at Spring Hill one Sunday, and then it would have been at Woodlawn the next, because it would be the same pastor. Okay. So the community would go to whichever church the service was at that Sunday. Okay. All right. That makes sense. And you, you mentioned that some of the people in town uh, that are still in town remembered uh, growing up and going to, to school. And you, you kind of alluded to, to, you know, that they, they have stories uh, to share. Uh, what, what did it sort of mean to them when you started up this museum and, and started to work on your, your collection and, and to talk about uh, Tina Turner? I, I would imagine they, they came in and shared a lot of stories. Oh, they did. They did. You know, but mainly they were excited that the school was being safe because it was just as much a part of their history as it was hers. Yeah. And so they had lots of fond memories of the school. You know, when we were researching the school, what we found out was that not only did Tina attend that school, but the founder of the school was her great, great uncle, her great, great grandfather. And he were brothers. So Tina wound up with a family connection to the school as well. But when you when you really look at everything, that whole community was connected as far as family wise and uh, all of that. So all of the kids that attended that school were were connected in some way. And what's really interesting is the founder of the school, Benjamin Flagg, he his one of his responsibilities was to, you know, find the teachers. And of course you only had to have an eighth grade education because that was as high as it went. Hmm. And So he found teachers. Well, his children became teachers. His grandchildren are teachers. And we interviewed several of his grandchildren who talked about remembering their grandfather and how important education was to him and how important it was for him to provide somewhere for the kids of that community to have an education and how that influenced their profession, their choice of professions just because of his passion for that very reason. So he has a long line of legacy of teachers and in shaping children's lives. And, you know, that's really important where this school is concerned too, because at the time there was no uh, public education for black children Hmm. when he built that school. So, and it was a subscription school. Each family paid a dollar a child for it to attend, for the child to attend, and that that money went to pay the teacher and for the upkeep of the building. So it it was a community effort that that has just paid off in dividends since then. Right. Wow. What a what a different time, a different time for sure. Um, So the Tina Turner Museum there in Brownsville, Tennessee, you're about you're about an hour or so east of Memphis, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about how you got your um, collection started, the, the things that you have on display, the items. Um, I mean, did you guys, you know, have to uh, 
uh, reach out right away or, or, or were there people who were willing to donate certain things just to kind of get you guys started? So the collection that's inside the actual schoolhouse is all Tina's. It all came from her personally. Okay. Yeah. She, uh, we reached out to her early on in the project. We knew we were going to save the school. We had already started that process. We reached out to her just to let her know what we were doing, that we had, you know, we knew it was the school she attended. Uh, we wanted to be able to say that. We wanted her permission to say that. And so she was kind enough to say, yes, you can. Um, then later on, as we started the, so let me back up. The city of Brownsville actually paid to have the school moved, but then it was up to us to raise private funds to restore the school. So once we got it moved and once she saw we were raising money and we were making improvements to the school, you know, like fixing the roof was the first thing so we could get it totally in the dry and then start doing the other things. And once she saw we were really doing that because we were keeping her updated as we went along, the, you know, the next thing I knew, her assistant was calling me saying, we're going to send some costumes, gold records, some things from her career. Mm. And we also want to send our designer and our architect to help uh, create the displays. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. There are people who I know have, have tried similar things for other artists and they just don't even seem to care. <laughs> and so it's nice that uh, that she was not only supportive, but also uh, willing to lend a, a helping hand to, to do that for you guys. I think that's that's really cool. Um, when when people come through the museum, uh, travelers and and I assume that you meet people from all over the world because her you know her music just you know popular all over the planet, um, so I'm sure you meet people from from not only all walks of life but people from all over the world that that come into the museum. In 2019, we had people from 50 different countries come through. Nice. Nice. Yeah. And there's and there's so many things that you can see musically in that region of the United States. And it certainly makes sense to include this on your on your road trip with your if you're going through there. Um, but but tell me, you know, when people come through, whether they're from, you know, here in America or Australia or Europe or wherever, uh, what are some of the things in your collection that they're they're sort of really drawn to if they're Tina Turner fans? Oh, gosh. Um, we have the costumes from her last tour. We have the video playing, so you can actually watch her performing on the video and look around and see the, the clothes that she has on. Probably the one that gets the most attention is the Mad Max costume. Okay. The one that she wore on stage, not in the actual movie. Uh, this is her stage costume that she performed, um, Beyond Thunderdome, we okay. don't need it. We don't need another hero. Yeah, uh, in the Beyond Thunderdome Mad Max movie, um, we have that in there, and it's you know it's bigger than life. It's real chain mail, and the wig is really three feet long. And <laughs> um, you know, personally, the thing that shocked me most about that costume, you know, I'd seen the movie a, a dozen times, and I always felt sorry for her ears and those huge earrings. Well, they're they're sewn into the wig, so oh, <laughs> you know, a little little spoiler there. But I was relieved to see <laughs> that they were sewn in because I had felt so sorry for. See, and as a as a man, this is horrible. I that didn't even cross my mind. So you know, I'll just uh, but that's a good that's a good point. Um, that is really cool. What what are some of the other things that people might uh might be able to check out when they when they pop in the Tina Turner Museum? So one of the fun things is that we have her senior high school yearbook from mm. Sumner High School. And of course, it's her real name in there, not Tina Turner. So people who, you know, of course, true fans, real fans that have been fans for years and years and years know her real name. But some Anna of the May. newer fans, right, yeah. some of the newer fans don't know Tina Turner's not her real name. Mm. So trying to figure out which one of those pictures and who she is in that yearbook is is a lot of fun. Uh, of, of course, in that yearbook, they asked the students to list what they wanted their profession to be. And she put entertainer. 
Uh, so she knew. She knew. She knew. I had read somewhere that Ike Turner actually, uh, and he he was a, a piece of work, and and we could do another whole another show on on Ike Turner, but but that he he actually trademarked that name Tina Turner, so that if she decided to leave, uh, he could find well, Tina Turner to perform along alongside of him. Did did you hear that? That's true, and that's. She went when they divorced. She went to court, and that was that was what she was awarded that name. She got to she got to she, keep got to keep the name. She got to keep the name. Now she got stuck with all his bills and everything uh, else, but she got to keep the name. You know, it's it's interesting, Sonia. I uh, I, I watch a lot of YouTube, and uh, uh, there was one day that. A, a Tina Turner concert popped up on there and I, I don't remember where it was, but, um, and, and I don't even know how old she was. I, I think it was maybe her final tour. And so I don't know what age that, that would have been. Um, but uh, you know, she was, she was an, an older woman and, and to watch her run up and down the stage in high heels, no less, and and on this and they had this thing that was going over the crowd. I don't know what this contraption was, but it was almost like the bucket from a fire truck. You know, this gigantic thing, and it's going over the crowd. And she's running up and down, and she's and and it it was the most remarkable thing I think I have ever seen a performer do. Uh, and and to and not fall. And I'm just watching it, just cringing. Oh my God, please don't fall. Please don't fall. Please don't fall. Uh, she was just, she was absolutely incredible in concert. And and almost, almost I guess you would say like an athlete because of the way when she performed. It was it's just absolutely unbelievable. She would have to be an athlete because another little fun fact about the costumes that are in the museum is they all weigh anywhere from 15 to 20 to 30 pounds. Wow. So she had that much extra weight on her bouncing around on stage like she did. <laughs> I mean, you have to be an athlete to do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. It's it's unbelievable. Super super talented. And then uh and then we you have all of the people that would be part of her her entourage on stage um now correct i don't remember the names did, did did the backup dancers have a certain name what were they were they called you know gladys knight had her had the pips did, 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 did tina turner's backup band and backup uh dancers did they have a particular name i can't remember well she called her dancers her flowers her flowers okay mm -hmm. okay with, with ike and tina they were the ikeettes but with tina they were her flowers yeah, yeah, that's uh, it's it's pretty cool. If if seriously, folks, if you've never just taken the time to go on YouTube and just type in Tina Turner concert, uh, and, and even if you're not really familiar with her music, which I I always assume everybody knows everybody that we talk about on this podcast, and I know that that's not always true, but just go just go watch her show and and you'll probably be just worn out from from watching her on, watching her on stage it's uh it, it's it's pretty remarkable uh last thing that i'll ask you sonia you, you said you've reached out to her do, would I mean, do you do you talk to her frequently would, would you say that that she she knows you well um what, what's what would be your relationship with with tina turner she definitely keeps up with everything that's going on here um, I've only talked to her and met her in person one time. She immediately knew who I was and hmm. that kind of, I kind of, you know, I was like, man, how does she know who I am? And then I realized I was the only other person in the room she didn't know. So, you know, process <laughs> yeah. of elimination would be that's who I am. But, um, she does, you know, we, um, we communicate mainly through email now. Hmm. Um, her assistant, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, uh, would come here often. Hmm. And so we communicated uh, through her, through Ron Graham. Uh, now it's mostly just through email. And um, yeah, she, you know, we still update her on everything that's happening. And she's still very much involved in it. That's really cool. And then so she now lives, is it, she's in Switzerland, right? She is, yes. Yeah. All right. That's pretty great. Uh, well, I hope folks will go and check it out. As I mentioned, you know, earlier that that part of of America 
um, you know, especially, you know, that part of Tennessee, whether you're starting in Memphis or you're starting there in, uh, in Brownsville, so many cool things to see. And the Tina Turner Museum um, should be at the top of your list. Real quick, I, I know you have other um, things going on there besides just the Tina Turner Museum and, and that schoolhouse. What, what are some of the other uh, properties that people can see when they come visit? So for blues fans, we have the last home of blues pioneer Stevie John Estes. Uh, he and two other pretty prominent bluesmen from this area were part of the early 1900s when blues was just starting to become a genre and kind of starting to get out there. He was rediscovered in the 60s during the blues revival and then traveled all over the world. Uh, we also have the West Tennessee Music Museum where you can see people like Elvis, of course, but Carl Perkins, um, Denise LaSalle, we have another small Tina exhibit in there. There are um, Conway Twitty's first drummer is in there. Carl Mann, who um, had a hit with the rock version of Mona Lisa. Uh, Alex Harvey, who was a songwriter. Reuben James, a lot of Kenny Rogers songs. Delta Dawn hmm. probably is the most uh, recognizable. He was from Brownsville. There's just, I think there's like 20 or 30 something other West Tennessee artists in the West Tennessee Music Museum that people will immediately recognize. Hank Williams Jr., um, Eddie Arnold, just from all genres um, across the board of all the incredible talent that's come out of this region. Lots of good music. Lots of good music. Well, cool. Uh, if folks want to learn more um you know directions and all that good stuff what's the uh, what's a website they can check out westtnheritage.com okay westtnheritage.com well this was fun thank you sonia i appreciate you updating us on everything going on down there and um and uh, yeah keeping tina turner's legacy alive well thank you bill i appreciate talking to you and can't wait for the book my thanks to Sonia. Happy to include the Tina Turner Museum on the ultimate American music bucket list. It's a great spot to add to any musical road trip through the South. If you like the podcast, please share it with family and friends. Let them know they can search for it on any podcast platform. Just search for American Music Bucket List. And if you'd like a copy of the book, which includes many great stops throughout the state of Tennessee, you can order a signed copy at AmericanMusicBucketList.com. I'm Bill Cleveland. I appreciate you listening. Do us a favor and rate this podcast five stars if you enjoyed the stories. That's a big help for us. And if you want to follow my road trips across America, you can do that by logging on to BillOnTheRoad.com.